Well, a lot of YouTubers have been talking about how great the Galaxy S9 is. Tons of people providing interesting feedback, and here I am. I, I do this for a lot of reviews, and I'm gonna do it again. If you're expecting a just non-biased, objective review without bringing up the iPhone, and you just talk about the S9 as the S9 and nothing else, and you just talk about its features, if you want that kind of a review, go somewhere else. There's tens, probably hundreds, of different S9 videos out there that will just tell you all of the great things about it, what they do and don't like, and some tips and tricks. You're not really gonna get that here. In fact, if you really like the S9 and you're thinking about getting it, you probably won't want to watch this. Most of this review is going to be biased rambling and you don't have to wait to the end for my recommendation. I don't like this. I'm not a fan of the S9. I'll explain why, but just keep in mind, this is totally biased. This is not me treating the S9 completely fair. A lot of this is just literally me not liking the way Samsung makes their phones. So with that in mind, let's talk about the Galaxy S9 Plus. It's not like I hate everything about this phone, so I wanted to start off with some of the things I like. For one, Samsung's build quality has always been very premium. The look and feel of the phone is very luxurious with that metal and glass design. It's pretty comfortable to hold. I find the edges of the S9 actually a little bit sharp compared to my iPhone 10. With that stainless steel and round off body, it's a bit softer to hold, whereas this kind of cuts into your palms a little bit because it's two edges of glass meeting in the middle, but it's by no means a bad design. I love that they're able to basically have no camera bump on the back. There's a little bit of a ridge, but other than that, it's a very clean looking UI while still containing a lot of traditional and new features. So if you care about this sort of thing, it still has the headphone jack, USB-C, fast charger in the box, and of course, wireless charging as well. So we've got bits of the future, bits of the past, all kind of meeting in the middle, especially in 2018. You don't see headphone jacks too much anymore. Samsung though, sticking by their claims and keeping it there, which I respect. It's one of the few smartphones that actually includes a fast charger and earbuds. The more you think about it, you realize how rare that is in smartphones these days. Samsung likes to include a full package. The other thing I really like is the display. I'm a huge fan of big phones. I like my iPhone 10 a lot, but I'm really looking forward to the Plus model because I would much rather have a six and a half inch iPhone than a 5.8 inch. The S9 Plus has a 6.2 inch, very vibrant, very bright display that is really cool for watching videos on. Colors look great. They do, of course, push it right to the edge with their curved displays. And I don't know what's changed exactly. Maybe I didn't notice it back with the Galaxy S or maybe I was less of an Apple sheep a year ago, but I definitely noticed more distortion with these curved displays, and I'm starting to realize why that's not catching on as an industry standard. Way back last year, we originally thought the iPhone was gonna have a curved display just like the Galaxy, but after using the S9, it's kind of been a reminder as to why we don't do that. I watch a lot of videos on here and view a lot of content and definitely noticed a lot of accidental touches when reaching up to the top of the display, and when watching videos, the curve on the edge is definitely noticeable, which has been kind of bizarre are, and sometimes I set it off on accident. I've seen other people comment on that as well, but it's still by no means a bad display. It's really cool to look at from every angle. And like I said, very bright. It's in fact a little bit brighter than the S8. Works good in direct sunlight. And one of the last things I'll bring up for things I like is the speakers. A big complaint I had with the S8 is that it just kind of has that one tiny speaker on the bottom. If you cover that up, you can't hear a thing. These speakers get crazy loud, definitely louder than my iPhone. And while they do sound a little bit distorted, you can definitely still hear them. It's not so distorted distorted, you can't make out anything. I recently subscribed to Hulu and I've been watching a lot of content on here with that. I was never really sure exactly what the Dolby Atmos mode was, but I turned it on and basically things just got louder. And I was like, oh, so Dolby mode is just loud, okay. But still, very impressive for a smartphone speakers. That was a big complaint a lot of people had with the S8 and they fixed it here, which was good. And of course, the first thing you'll see a lot of people bring up about the S9 is that new location for the fingerprint sensor because every other Android company puts it there. Samsung decided to be the oddball and put it somewhere else and then realized, eh, no one likes that. Let's just cave in and do what everyone else is doing. Funny, it's like that might happen with the headphone jack later. But that brings me into my first downfall of the S9, which is the login methods, the biometrics, the security. I think this is something that I notice a lot more now because I'm switching to this S9 full-heartedly, by the way. I've only been using this for the past week. No iPhone 10 at all. My SIM card is in here. My Apple Watch is still connected to my iPhone back home via cellular connection, but I'm not getting any text on here other than a couple of iMessage accounts. All of my notifications, all of my reading, all of my tweeting, all of that's been done through here. And I think the reason I liked the S8 a lot more was I was switching from an iPhone 7. Back then, there was no face unlock on iPhones and all I had was the fingerprint reader. And for those of you who don't know, I have a skin disease known as psoriasis. It's very common. And that means that fingerprint sensors do not work for me. I can try to record it into a device and it will forget it very quickly. With a MacBook, it forgets it after about a week. With an iPhone, it forgets it after about an hour. 
and with the S9, it didn't remember it a single time. I was just curious if the S9 had a magical fingerprint reader, so I tried to log in with my fingerprint, and it said fingerprint added, and then I locked the phone, tried to unlock it again, didn't work. Forgot me like that. But I don't dock the S9, that's a normal thing. My fingerprints are weird. Yes, I can make the perfect murderer, make all your jokes. But now that I'm switching from an iPhone 10 and not from an iPhone 7, I have face unlocks to compare this time. And there are three, kind of four different ways to unlock your phone with the S9. You can use the fingerprint reader on the back, you can use iris scanning, a technology first introduced with the Note 7, and it's been on every Galaxy since then, and they haven't really changed it since then. And you have face unlock, which is basically the same method as a OnePlus 5T, it uses the front-facing camera to see if your face is there, but it's not very secure. That's why a lot of apps and agencies say, eh, you can't unlock your phone with that face because it's basically just looking from a picture history. Very easy to fool, not very secure. And with the S9, they introduced this thing called Smart Unlock, which combines iris scanning and face unlock, and I thought that would be the best way. My issue with the login methods on the S9, though, and you'll find this is a running theme with my complaints of the S9, is that there are lots of different options to get in, yes, and that's kind of the thing about the Galaxy phones, is they have tons of options, but none of them are truly perfected. None of them work flawlessly. Every single method has some problem with it. I couldn't find a sweet spot, and that's me ignoring my psoriasis. Even if I had perfect hands, the fingerprint reader, while in a more ergonomic place, is not friendly to wireless charging. Samsung's always been kind of the innovator and the leader when it comes to getting phones to adapt to inductive charging, and they sell a lot of wireless chargers themselves that allow the phone to sit in a cradle or sit flat, or of course with Samsung DeX, plug it directly into this little trackpad base and use your phone as a trackpad. The issue with putting the fingerprint reader on the back is it means that when you're wireless charging, when you're in DeX, now the fingerprint reader is removed. In order to unlock the phone, you have to pick it up, grip it, and then set it back down, which is not intuitive. That would be a problem regardless of my skin condition. On top of that, I've given this phone to a lot of my friends and let them try it, and I've seen far too many people put their hands right over the camera. Because that fingerprint ridge is right next to the cameras, and you're feeling around back there, your finger doesn't exactly know where to go. Of course, you can get used to it, but it just means that when you're reaching around, you kind of have to feel exactly where your finger's supposed to go, and I can tell why Apple didn't want to do this on the iPhone 10. It's not an intuitive way of doing it. If you want to unlock that way with wireless charging, it's kind of awkward, especially with Samsung DeX. And even if you're just holding the phone, a lot of people reach too high and they have to feel their way down to the actual fingerprint reader. That's just in my experience. I'm sure a lot of people who use the S9 every day, you probably get used to it, but still not a flawless unlock mechanism. Now face unlock can be very, very fast, similar to the OnePlus 5T because of just being able to check with a simple camera picture. Is this the same person? Yes, it is okay unlock. You can just turn your phone on and it'll unlock just like that with the face unlock feature. But the issue I run into here is it's anti-lock screen. A lot of the times I'm opening my phone, I just want to check notifications. I don't necessarily want to open the whole phone and go to those apps. So they have a different setting for that when you can turn off the fast unlock of face unlock, which means that it won't start searching for your face until you swipe up on the lock screen. That way you can still read your notifications, but it won't just show notifications for a second, ignore you, and go straight to the home screen. And then you got to swipe down to find all your notifications. This is a problem I see with a lot of face unlock features is that when you have really quick opening speeds, which is cool if you want to be fast, it's kind of confusing if you just are checking your notifications. Your phone just buzzed. You're like, hey, what was that? Tap on the screen. You start to read a notification and then it cuts immediately to the home screen. It just feels a little odd. Apple had a lot of these complaints with the iPhone 6S because the fingerprint reader was so fast. So that's when they introduced press home to open. You could hold your finger there. It would say unlocked at the top, but you would have to press the home button to actually get to your home screen. That way you could still read your notifications, but the phone's not jumping away from something while you're reading it. And while it's cool that there's a setting there so that it doesn't just jump to the home screen, the issue with the face unlock on the S9 is that it doesn't start looking for your face until after you swipe. They get this unlock mechanism completely backwards. I think Apple kind of nailed it with Face ID. With the S9, you check your notifications, and if you want to open the phone, you swipe up, and then it starts looking for your face. Finds your face, and then goes to the home screen. It's like an extra extra middle step. What's so nice and easy about the iPhone 10 is as soon as you tap on the display, it's already searching for your face. Doesn't matter if you swipe up or not. You tap on the display, it starts looking for your face, sees it, unlocks, and then if you want to open the phone, you can swipe up and there's no more middle step. It's already been unlocked. You just swipe up and you go home. Whereas this, you swipe up, it waits to see your face, sees your face, then unlocks. So there's a lot of comparison tests where that show Face ID being slower, which can be true in a lot of instances, but Face ID I think is more intuitive because of the order of the step. 
apps. With this, it can be very fast, but you're not gonna be able to read your notifications. With the iPhone 10, it is a little bit slower, but it's not anti-lock screen. It doesn't just jump to the home screen as fast as possible. And with iris scanning, we still have a lot of the same problems we did with the S8. You have to hold it at an exact right angle. With iris scanning, both on the S9 and S8, it has to be about eight to 20 inches away from your face and held at the right angle. I've noticed with iris scanning, you don't have as much freedom as you do with face ID. With face ID, it works from an arm's distance. My arm can be extended all the way and it can still see my face. Not the same here. If my phone's too far away or I'm holding it kind of weird or what's even more common, I'm tired, I just woke up and it's dark, my eyes are a little droopy. The phone says, I can't see your eyes. Open your eyes wider now. And then they'll even start to raise the brightness of the display to try to see you better, which is just so infuriating when you just wake up. You're like, ah, what's on my phone? IR sensor starts blinking at the top. You can visibly see it. Unlike the iPhone 10, it's invisible. It says, ah, open your eyes wider and then turns up the display brightness. And I'm just kind of like, ow, phone, stop. I don't wanna, oh, why do I have to unlock this way? That was pretty frustrating. The benefit of iris scanning is that it works in the dark, but it has the same flaw of face ID of not working in daylight. Face unlock works in daylight, but it does not work in the dark. So if you wanna use face unlock, if you're in a pitch black room, it's not going to work. So I was thinking that smart unlock would solve all these problems, but you can't change the fact that iris scanning is just not intuitive, especially in the morning. If you're in a dark room and you just check your phone, it's like, hold your phone closer, open your eyes wider, and sometimes it'll still fail. It's just not been reliable. With the smart unlock, I think it worked about 30% of the time for me. I'm not exaggerating that. With iPhone 10s, there's definitely times face ID doesn't work. It doesn't get a good read, but it works more like 70% of the time. Most of the time I can count on my iPhone 10 noticing me and then unlocking when I need it to. This it was always just kind of a gamble. And a lot of the time I would just end up leaving the display on because I didn't want to unlock it again. A very common scenario for a lot of people and especially myself is I have this little mounted Qi charger on my desk. I like to put my iPhone 10 there and I tap on it. It's pointed at me at the exact right angle and it just unlocks. And then I can see my notifications. If I need to open the phone, I swipe up. With the S9, I found myself having to press the bottom part of the display hard because if you turn off the always on display, which just kind of bugs me, I'm always annoyed when there's stuff on the display even though the phone is off. I turn that off, there's no way to activate tap to wake now. No double tapping, no tapping around the screen. You have to push hard where the home button is to get the screen to turn on or hit the on button, which is just more complicated. I like my iPhone 10 because I can just tap on the screen. Also raise to wake is a very nice feature on the iPhone 10. If you lift up your phone, it turns on, starts looking for your face and unlocks. With the S9, it's this much more complicated process that can be faster in just a street test when you're holding both phones right next to each other, but it doesn't apply as much because when I hold up my S9, it doesn't automatically turn on. I hold it up, have to hit the power button or the home button. It either starts looking immediately and jumps to the home screen or just shows me my notifications. Then I swipe up and then it starts looking. And if it's dark, then the iris scanner's like, where are you? And with smart unlock, it doesn't show you what the IR sensors can see. So you don't exactly know where to put your eyes. Whereas if you don't use smart unlock and just use the iris scanner, you can see exactly where your eyes need to be. But do you realize how long I'm talking about this one thing? It's so complicated and it's very difficult to explain as to why I don't like it, but you can't deny that Apple's just works. There's one way to log in and it's effective. You know, there's no disclaimer saying if you use Face ID with a baby, it could damage their eyesight. If you're setting up the iris scanning, take off your glasses or take out your contact lenses. Consult your doctor if iris scanning is okay. This just seems very complicated and no matter what way you log in with the S9, there's some kind of issue along the way. iPhone 10 Face ID has its flaws, doesn't work that great in direct sunlight, but I just found it more reliable. And I like having things like raise to wake, tap to wake. I think those should be defaults. And instead Samsung says, well, you gotta have the always on display for that to work. Or you gotta download some third party APK to try to get it to do that. I'm sure there's some amount of tweaking you can do to get it to do exactly what I'm describing. But that brings me to my next point, which is the software. It is very, very distracting on the S9, how it almost feels like a Frankenstein of an operating system. There's two versions of everything. Samsung and Google are just like playing tug of war over this Galaxy phone. You've got two digital assistants, two browsers, two messaging apps, two photo libraries, two email apps, and even two calculators. They couldn't even decide that, eh, maybe we should just leave the Google calculator on there. No, Samsung needs to have their own calculator on here, but if it's gonna run Android, it also needs the Google version of the calculator. What this results in is thousands and thousands of questions. Every time you open an app, every time you try to save a preset, it has to ask you, which one? Which one do you want to use? I want to save a contact. Which contacts app? You want to save it on the phone or your Google account or your Samsung account? I wish there was an option that just said, save it. Save it to all three of these. I don't care as long as it's easy. Why do you have to ask me every single time? This could be 
be an issue with third-party Androids. And probably a reason a lot of you like stock Android so much is just that third parties bloat up the Android experience to an almost unusable caliber. And I do firmly apologize to people in the past that I've said, just get a Samsung because you can alter it to make it look like stock Android. I did not realize how complicated that is. I changed my mind full heartedly on that. Trying to tolerate this type of skin on Android is very difficult and it takes a lot of tinkering to make it feel like a seamless experience. Because of what Samsung has to jam in there and what Google has to jam in there, it's very frustrating. And as you guys probably saw in the unboxing video, notifications do not stop. Let's just test out these stereo speakers because I've heard they're pretty, okay. Shh. Stop. Okay, stop, please, please. Okay. See, with my iPhone, you know, there's a ringer switch, which I don't really need. I kind of like that the S9 doesn't have a ringer switch. But to me, the phone should make a noise, make a noise if it's not on silent. And if it is on silent, it should buzz. With the S9, when you got a notification by default, it makes a loud noise and buzzes. So when it's sitting on my desk, it goes dun -dun 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 -dun, and it just feels obnoxious. I don't feel like there should be a setting that allows for the notifications to go. I literally cut that part of the unboxing video down because it kept going on for a good 20 to 30 seconds. A lot of people complain about iOS notifications, but you know what's nice about them? When you download a third-party app, it asks, would you like this app to send you notifications? With Android, they ask you which contacts app you want to use, which calculator you want to use, which browser you want to use, which do you use, which do I open? But when you download third-party apps, it does not ask you, can we send you notifications? So what it results in is just these like endless streaks of notifications from all different kinds of things. It notifies you when an app is draining battery faster than other apps. It has to provide a notification when you take a screenshot. And then when you take a screenshot, it has to ask, can I access the library? No, I just wanted you to take a screenshot but not save it anywhere. Thanks, Samsung, you really thought that one through. There are permissions asked both on Android and iOS for security reasons, I get that. But sometimes when it's part of the system UI, I just don't get it. Taking a screenshot doesn't need to be in your notifications and it doesn't need to ask permissions to access a gallery. And then you say, yes, you can access the gallery they go, which one? There's just so many questions. No matter how long I use this, no matter how long I try to get used to it, every time I perform an action, it has to ask me something else. Can we access this? Which app do you want to use? I think a lot of people don't understand how notifications on iOS works because they're used to Android where they just have to hit allow constantly. If you were used to Android and you're constantly hitting okay, allow, 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 then yeah, you're going to mess up your notifications on iOS because you're going to hit allow on applications that are going to send notifications every 10 seconds. The simple solution is just don't hit allow. You'll get the little badge app icon on the app. If you want to check your Twitter notifications, you open the phone. You can see the little app icon there. You don't want 20 notifications on your lock screen all at once. I agree with people who say that's weird. It should, should be a collapsible menu. On top of that, but you don't want to spend all this time in your lock screen. If there's 20 notifications, just go and open the app. Good thing Android has a clear all notifications menu because you have to use it constantly. If you're playing music from Apple Music and Google Play Music, Music, it has to keep those now playing tabs separate. Real nice thing about iOS, there's only one menu for now playing. If you're playing Google Play Music, you can control that. If you're playing Apple Music, you can control that. You don't need a different menu from every now playing app because no one's listening to two different songs at the same time. I don't even think you can do that. <sighs> We're not even close yet, are we? The notifications bother me. I know people say iOS isn't good at notifications, but it's because you hit allow on every single app. I understand why you do that. You're probably used to Android where you just have to hit allow constantly. But if it's an app that you get a lot of notifications for and you don't want that filling up your lock screen, don't hit allow. It's very simple. I don't hit allow on Twitter. I don't hit allow on Instagram. I keep those apps out of my lock screen because I only want to get notified about that if I'm looking. I can see it on the badge app icon. Where this doesn't even ask. It just starts sending you weather notifications. It just starts sending you YouTube notifications. There's no permission. It doesn't ask, can YouTube send notifications? It just starts filling it up quickly. I'm not a fan of that. On top of that, I thought that because this is a new aspect ratio, and it kind of isn't because the S8's been around for a year, that there would be a lot more app support for these taller displays. But in fact, a lot of the games I play would be boxed in. Even Minecraft doesn't support the wide view of the S9. Even though the S8 is the same resolution, same aspect ratio, and it's been out for a year, 
a lot of apps still don't support this. Whereas my iPhone 10, not even that old, it's a brand new resolution, it's a brand new aspect ratio for iOS, supports nearly all the games I have on it. It's always fully supported. What's up with that? Why, why don't developers update their apps for this? Speaking of developing apps, we should probably mention AR Moji about now. AR Moji feels like it was built in like two days, not even, like two hours. The developers were like, ah, Animoji's cool, let's throw this together. I'll hit create AR Moji and it gets this face that doesn't look like me in the slightest. I don't understand how it works. I think it literally just takes a picture of your face and tries to skin it onto a Nintendo me character. No one likes it. Everyone agrees it's dumb. It doesn't work that well either. On top of that, we've got the Bixby button. It's a bad sign if all of the developers and all of the reviewers out there are telling you how to disable the Bixby button. And by disabling it, they don't mean reroute it. They mean just make it so the button is useless. So clicking it does nothing. This is not a harmless design. This design means that people don't know that they're not clicking the volume button. Anytime I hand this to someone, they go, wait, it's not turning on. I'm pressing the button. And I go, no, 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 that's the useless Bixby button. Don't click that one. And on top of that, to deactivate Bixby, even when you deactivate the open Bixby now tab, you have to hold it down. People hold it down, Bixby starts listening, but then people realize, oh, you have to keep holding the Bixby button in order for her to listen. You can't just hold it down for a little bit and then she starts listening like Siri does on the iPhone 10. And my goodness, you think Siri's bad? Bixby knows nothing. I asked her to do some simple math calculations. And again, she asked me, which calculator do I use? Even Siri could do that. I could ask Siri, how do I say I love you in French? The HomePod all of you guys hate can do that. Bixby doesn't know that. She searches the web for it. I thought Bixby was powered by Google. Shouldn't she know how to translate things? Having an extra button that no one wants to use is extremely annoying because you can't get rid of it. I don't think that we should all have a camera button or reroute it to something else. If Bixby's supposed to be a hands-free assistant that allows you to use your phone freely without having to touch it, don't make a dedicated button for it. That defeats the purpose of the digital assistant. And on top of that, you can just hold your home button and activate the Google Assistant, which we all know is infinitely better. Why would anyone use Bixby? Bixby literally racks up XP if you ask her questions. It's like, you're on level four, Bixby. Why is there XP for asking questions? I mean, there's like activity rings for your Apple Watch, but that's because you're exercising, you're doing something. This is literally just like open maps and that's it. I mean, I'm confused by Bixby. I thought after a year she would be smarter. She's not at all. She's just as dumb as she was on the S8. At least in my everyday life, there may be some things she's been smarter at, but I don't need those features, whatever they are. I haven't found them other than like Bixby Lens, which can live translate things, but it's powered by Google. So I don't understand what's changed. But speaking of lenses, the S9 has a pretty good camera. It's the first Samsung phone that can shoot at 4K at 60 for about five minutes. And then you have to stop. See, I vlog on the Talos of Talks channel. So I was also vlogging on this rig and quite ordinarily with my iPhone, I would vlog for over five minutes at a time. So it's kind of frustrating that when you switch to this camera, you have to be like, oh, are the five minutes up yet? Oh, they are. Time to reset the camera. I'm still unsure as to why they do this. They say it's because the Snapdragon 845 is so slow, it overheats if it records for over five minutes. But as soon as the five minutes are up, you can just keep going right after that. It's like a dumb DSLR camera that stops recording after 15 minutes and you just have to keep pressing the button every 15 minutes, except it's shrunken on this phone to five. So every five minutes you have to go on the back and hit start again. And I just, I, I, I don't get it. If you're able to start recording exactly after the five minutes, it's clearly not that hot. So they just have it built into the software to stop every five minutes. Or if you do 4K at 30, it's 10 minutes. You're filming a children's play, you're filming a sports game, a speech or something, that's going to annoy you. Not a problem on the iPhone. The iPhone can record until the storage is full. Like I said, it's not a bad camera. It can get colors very good. They can look very crisp. I found that portrait mode to be kind of disappointing. It's not super good at detecting what bokeh should be. But I mean, all smartphones other than the Pixel 2 are pretty bad at that. But I just noticed my iPhone 10 portrait shots looking a lot better. Maybe that's just my personal preference, but especially when I would do front facing selective focus. I think it's that makeup filter, that touch up feature Samsung puts that makes people look really fake and it's that wide angle. They design it so you can fit a lot of people in one picture, but for selfies, it just makes your nose look big. Never really been a fan of the wide angle front facing. I think on iPhone 10s, it looks a lot more modern. It looks a little bit more telephoto. If you're a photographer, you take portrait shots in telephoto. Very rarely do they just take super wide angle shots with bokeh because the idea of wide angle is to get more stuff in the picture. But then if you blur the background, you're just getting more blur. So it basically works for extreme close-ups and that's about it. You've heard everyone talk about the variable camera aperture. It doesn't make a difference. They put all this work into making this actual physical aperture that can change on the camera lens, which you've seen YouTubers zoom in on and see, you can see it actually changing. But then when you see the difference in pictures, it really doesn't matter. It's like, ah, this red dot changed a little bit. Whoa, 
My point is they could have just had the aperture fixed at 1.5 and then you'd still have the good low light shots. This is okay at taking low light pictures, but every photographer knows if it's a low light situation, it's not on the camera for the picture to look good. It's on you, the photographer, to bring in more light. I've taken some low light pictures on this and they're still kind of grainy. I mean, I guess it's a little bit brighter than a typical smartphone, but still, it's not going to be the reason to upgrade to this. I should also mention that the S9 Plus at $840, pretty decent price. I think that's pretty fair. It's cheaper than the Pixel 2 XL. Kind of confuses the Galaxy lineup because now the Note 8 is kind of useless. The Note 8 costs like $100 more. It doesn't have the good speakers. It can't shoot 4K at 60. It has a worse battery life. Its display isn't as bright, but it's only 0.1 inches larger and the wide and telephoto lenses on the S9 Plus are better, yet the whole phone is cheaper. So unless you are just a die hard, I need an S Pen fan, the Note 8 is very expensive and has a lot worse stuff than this, which means that for the rest of the year, the Note 8 is kind of pointless. Who should buy that? Unless you're just a diehard stylus fan, which I don't know that many people who are like, I need a stylus on my phone. I don't care if it's more expensive. I don't care if there's less RAM. I don't care if it costs more. The camera sucks. The speakers suck. The display isn't as good. Wow. Okay, that's a lot to defend an S Pen for. But yeah, Note 8's kind of useless. And I think overall, the reason I've just not been very satisfied with the S9 compared to how happy I was with the S8 is that we recently just had a very massive change with the Apple lineup. This is an Apple Sheep channel. I think you were stupid to think I wasn't gonna bring up Apple in my S9 review. The iPhone just got its biggest refresh ever with the iPhone 10. We've got this near bezel display with the exception of that notch, but we've already had this Infinity display with the Galaxy lineup before. Meaning that when we switch to this, it doesn't really feel like much has changed, whereas iPhone users switching to the 10, it does feel like a lot's changed. Getting these faster CPUs, this wireless charging, the better cameras, that infinity display, switching to all gesture control. I actually find multitasking much easier on the iPhone 10 because I can just swipe back and forth between apps, whereas this is kind of a uh, multitasking, switch back and forth, uh, go back, go back to this app, double tap this button. It feels like a lot more button mashing, whereas the iPhone 10 just feels like swipe up to go home, side to side to switch between apps. Maybe that's why I've just found myself very disappointed with this. It's just because I've seen a massive change in the iPhone lineup and we're not seeing massive changes here. The S8 was really impressive if you were switching from an iPhone 7 because wow, the bezels are gone. Wow, this curved display. But now we've had the iPhone 10. We've had this newer contrast ratio. We've had this great pixel print. We've had this true tone display and we see one size bezel go all the way around. And then you see this and you go, okay, well you curved the sides, but you got this giant chin at the bottom with nothing on it. What's the point of that? We have face ID now which means that as soon as I'm reading my notifications, my phone's already checking to see if it's me. And if it is me, it's not going to jump to the home screen. It's just gonna let me know the phone is now unlocked. They didn't think that through with this. It's just kind of uneven across the entire process of the phone. Nothing really feels thought out. Everything kind of feels rushed and we gotta get this out of the market as quick as possible. So overall, I have to say my mind's been changed. Originally, when people would ask me, Drew, what's your go-to Android phone? I would say, ah, the latest Galaxy S phone. That phone has the most features. It's a pretty good price, I would switch to that. After the software and hardware annoyances with this phone, I can't really say that anymore. I don't think Samsung's my go-to Android company anymore, and do not think this means this changes my opinion on the Pixel. That's still overpriced, and just because you have a cleaner UI does not justify the more expensive price tag with lacking hardware, slower hardware, less features. That does not make it worth it. I'm talking more, I think I would go more with the essential phone route because it's cheaper with pretty good design, or the OnePlus 5 routes. Those seem like pretty good deal phones, and I think I would go that route if I had to go Android. But overall, I'm glad I don't have to go Android, because I'm very much looking forward to switching back to my iPhone 10. I miss it, and I'll keep in mind, at the end of this video, did I bring up the Apple ecosystem? Is the reason I don't like the S9 because of Apple's ecosystem? No, but that definitely is keeping me tied to my iPhone 10. This phone is bad on its own. It doesn't matter that it doesn't have a huge ecosystem supporting it. So I'm sorry if I disappointed you. If you have the S9 and you enjoy it, I'm happy for you. You. I hope you keep enjoying it, but I'm gonna pass. This is not for me. Thank you guys for sticking around for such a long video. Love to hear all of your such supportive thoughts in the comments below. This is your Apple Sheep here, and I will see you in the next one.